how is it? How are you? Oh, doing well, thank you. Great. So yeah, we, we spoke a lot and I think people saw it, it was recorded. And today I want to speak with you more about like, hey, what happened the last 50 years? So yes, 50 years, I was born then, 71, when Greenpeace was founded. Um, you were one of the founding partners, founding members actually, right? What happened since then? How did the environmental movement change from that moment in 1971 and now in 2021? Well, the modern environmental movement certainly began in like 1970, 71. I remember I attended the um, UN conference on the environment in 1972 in Stockholm, in Sweden. And uh, certainly people are much more aware now than they were. I remember uh, we took up a, a billboard in Vancouver in Canada um, in 1971. It was a big billboard. It had the word uh, ecology and uh, in big letters in yellow on green. And uh, in small letters on the bottom, it says, uh, look it up and get involved. Nobody even knew what the word meant. So uh, we've certainly come a long way since then. But the knowledge was there very early, right? That we can't continue growing our industry the way we did and taking such a toll and, and hitting nature so hard. I mean, it, the messages stayed in a way the same. Uh, yeah, I, I saw a newspaper article for 1911 that was talking about the, uh, the contributions of the burning of coal to the greenhouse, you know, to uh, CO2 and the greenhouse effect and everything. So people have been a while aware of it well, for well over a, a century. Uh, but it's something that people wanted to ignore. Here's the real problem, uh, is that we're addicted to, to, to fossil fuels. It's simple as that. It's a drug, and we're addicted to it. Without fossil fuels, society will collapse. Uh, it's, it's not just oil and plastics. It's also fertilizers and, and others and that. And uh, so it, it's a very difficult thing to, 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 to deal with because the ever-increasing population, when I was born in 1950, there were 3 billion people. Now it's closing, I don't know, 8 billion people. And where does that end? Uh, this, the planet just simply doesn't have the resources to uh, continue, continue to support the increasing numbers. I mean, fossil fuel was like a big shift, right? I mean, suddenly you could do all these amazing things. You had energy in seemingly endless supply. And it was great business and they made a lot of like chemical ex, um, explorations. I mean, plastic came out of it and tons of other stuff. We are like addicts to it, right? Ironically, it actually saved the whales if it wasn't for the, uh, for the uh, you know, the uh, refining of petroleum, uh, the world's whales would be, have been wiped out completely. It was the whaling industry up until 1865 or 1870. And uh, so Rockefeller, strangely enough, was responsible for, you know, saving the whales. <laughs> because otherwise they would have used whale oil, right? Whale, whale oil. The, the price of whale oil in the 1860s was really high. It was and getting even higher because of the scarcity of the, uh, uh, of the oil. So it was the oil crisis of, it, of its time back in 1860, 1870. But then also there is the whole propagation of the... the, the communication around how a lifestyle should look, right? How should we behave? What should we, where should we travel to? I mean, there was an idea molded, where, which was based on, on wastefulness, right? I mean, you just eat something, you toss it. You have every, all the time availability of like, whatever, be it sushi, be it I, all kind of clothing, fast fashion was invented. I think the, the throw away culture was That's born. True. That's true. I mean, I lived in a world where plastic hadn't really been invented. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I walked on the beaches as a six-year-old in eastern Canada, we wouldn't have seen a single piece of plastic anywhere. The world got got along quite fine without without plastic. And now there certainly is no use for single-use plastic. But I mean, plastic can have its uses, but certainly not the single-use plastics. It's just so unnecessary. It's so, it's so cheap, so easily secured. But uh, the problem is it's, it, it is a finite resources. Those are the simple laws of ecology, that the, we need diversity of species, we need diversity within our ecosystems, all species are interdependent. But the most important law is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And when we steal the carrying capacity from other species, that causes diminishment in both in diversity and interdependence. It all leads to collapse. And where will that happen? I mean, a hundred years from now, in the world, the year, say, uh, you know, 21, uh, 21, uh, the world will either be the same as it was in 1820, or uh, 
it'll be worse. It was uh, sci-fi probably, probably gonna even sell air. Probably will not buy um, whatever, water in a glass bottle, but in big containers oh, like purified air. It's a constant adaptation to diminishment. In 1960, the very idea that you'd be buying your water in plastic bottles was unheard of. It was crazy. And to pay, the, uh, to pay that amount, a gallon of water today in, can range from anywhere for $20 to $50 a gallon, you know, depending on where you buy it. I mean, that's high, highly more expensive than a gasoline. I mean, it, it's, it's insanity from the point of view of 1968, for instance, to think that, that would, that's what people would evolve into. When was the first time you drank out of a plastic bottle as a child? I uh, can't really, probably in the 70s. I think Perrier, I was in London, I was in Paris, and uh, they Fancy had Perrier stuff. in the bottles. But since, you know, and then all of a sudden it was everywhere. But uh, it, it certainly wasn't anything. You know, we got our water out of the tap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but here's, here's, the insa here's the insanity of it. The water that comes out of the taps in New York City is actually cleaner than the water that's in the plastic bottles. Oh, but yeah, that's for sure. But we've adapted to that diminishment, so now it's unthinkable to not drink water unless it comes out of a bottle. Yeah, it feels convenient. It feels even honestly, people learn that oh, it must be safe. It's packed. I'm opening it. It's like packed for me. I'm the only person that will like open it up, and it will be prepared for me for that right moment. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what was what's the state of the the oceans? What's the state? Where do we stand in this whole like spiraling? Um, trend of destroying our nature and destroying the ecosystems that allow us to be here? Well, to be quite blunt, the oceans are dying and they're dying in our time. I think the most significant factor is to take this into regard that since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton, 40% diminishment in the bear in those species, which provides percent of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. If phytoplankton disappears from the sea, we all die. We do not live on this planet without phytoplankton. It, produ it produces the 70% where the world's forest produces the 30%. But so the we, ocean and the forest really that keep us alive, that give us what we need. The lungs of the earth, one is green and one is blue. Mm -hmm. And uh, phytoplankton uh, populations have been diminished because we have diminished a whale, seabird, uh, and uh, fish populations. Those species provide the nutrient base. In their feces, they provide the nutrient base of iron and, and, and nitrogen. Uh, which uh, is what the phytoplankton needs. So when you reduce those species numbers, you're reducing the number of phytoplankton and it's a vicious circle. And that alone is, I think, the most significant concern that I have is the disappearance of phytoplankton. Added to that, of course, is um, climate change, which is uh, impacting that, acidification. There's so many other factors. But uh, if we can't save the phytoplankton, then we're not going to save the sea. And if we can't save the sea, we're not going to save the planet. I mean, we're not going to save life as we know it, really. The planet will survive, but we won't. When we started Palais nine years ago, I was like super naive. I felt like, hey, we can all collaborate and we're bringing something to the environmental movement. There are already so many people out there that spend, like you, decades fighting for the cause. And I was a total newbie or we were a newbie. Um, and then we felt like, hey, let's meet everybody up and let's just find a way. How can we kind of accelerate the whole movement by collaborating? But then we got like really struck in the face heavily because people were extremely competitive. Right. I mean, I, I thought that was like a privilege of like politicians or the corporate yeah. world, but it feels that the environmental movement where theoretically we are all heading the same direction, um, well, it's actually you know, really a battle. Yeah. The strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity. Therefore, the strength of a movement should be dependent upon diversity also, diversity of approaches. So whether that approach is litigation, legislation, education, or direct intervention, it all points towards the same end. We all should be working together. But the reason there's so much competitiveness is really because there's a finite amount of uh, resources in the form of money uh, that to go to all of these groups. And they're all in competition to, uh, you know, to get those donated charitable dollars. And uh, for that reason, uh, th that's why you're, that's the reason there's so much infighting and everything like that. And yeah, that's one thing, but I also feel that often, even when I look at volunteers that don't per se have the, the need to bring the money in, right? They're, they're often like, tr if they're part of one organization, they're really bitching about others. They're like, hey, we know better. These guys are stupid. We, we are the best. We are doing it more credible. There is again, a war of silos. Um, and that is something to be very honest, they either copy you or they attack you, but it's very rare that they collaborate with you. 
Yeah, but what you have, you just have to ignore all that negativity and do what you do best to focus on what you're good at, uh, you know, and uh, that's what makes, that's what changes the world, really. Everybody has their skills, everybody has their their talents, and uh, and all together, it, it, it goes towards a common goal. We don't, actually don't really have to work together. We just have to work towards a common objective, and uh, that can lead there's many paths to that, to that objective. So we don't all have to be on the same page in order to get there. I mean, we designed ourselves as a collaboration network, to be honest, that was hard for us to swallow first. And we still, um, we are still believing in the, in this vision. And we found mostly small organizations, to be honest, that work with us very well. It's yeah. just problematic with the big ones, right? That yeah. consider themselves already as big brands, or they want to prove that they're the only ones existent out there. And, um, but hey, question for you. Um, what's the biggest success in the last 40 years ish of Sea Shepherd? Well, the biggest success for me is having turned Sea Shepherd from an organization to a global movement. And uh, we're now operating worldwide to stop poaching. That's what we focus on, really. Is I mean, from you being on a boat to lots of people out there becoming Sea Shepherd, organizing themselves. Yeah, dozens of campaigns, dozens of shifts, hundreds of volunteers at any one time, and uh, you know, shutting down hundreds and hundreds of illegal activities all over the all over the world. I mean, that's what we focus on. We don't pretend to be saving the world. We're just going after poachers here and poachers there, and and try to work with other uh, groups where we can. But one, the one thing that we found to be very successful is a collaboration with various governments around the world. And so now we're in partnership with a lot of African and uh, Latin American countries where they provide the authority and we provide the uh, material and the volunteers, the ships. So that means that we can protect their waters with their authority using our resources. And that's uh, we're now getting invited by more and more governments want us to get involved. So uh, especially it's been especially successful in African nations. We're working with you know, everybody from Liberia to Tanzania to Nibia, Gabon, Gambia, San Tome, Capo Verde. And uh, they're, they're, we're, we're making a difference. We're chasing the poachers out of their out of their waters. And we're doing the same in Peru and Mexico and uh, and Panama, Colombia. And uh, and I think that they're appreciating that because one thing that Sea Shepherd can do is cut through the bureaucracy. And that's you know, what's my next question, Paul. What are you doing different? I mean, on one side, I understand that some governments simply don't have money. They don't have money for fuel. They don't have the boats. They don't have a navy. They don't have um, surveillance. They don't have access to satellite feeds. I understand that piece, right? But then there are fully developed uh, uh, navies or even like EPA um, as a, in, in protection agencies or whoever, or coast guards and so on in other countries, they would have the means to intercept. Yes. But they don't. And what makes you different? What makes the approach of Sea Shepherd um, different from, let's say, an approach of a fully developed navy that is otherwise out there? Well, the countries we work in are so-called non-developed countries or whatever. And their problem is, is that their, their resources are being plundered by the rich countries, European, Asian fishing fleets that are going into their waters, stealing those fish. And uh, so they're, they're anxious to get our support. We have a lot of hostility from Europe and from Asia because uh, these foreign fishing fleets are being heavily subsidized by the European Union or by Japan or by China. And um, so they have the, those governments are supporting the industry. And uh, the countries which are being plundered are the countries that are working with us. So they see the problem. Right now, for instance- um, But they're uh, also often self-inflicted, right? There's often like a deal going on where somebody sells fishing rights to like some foreign fishing fleets, et cetera. Well, here it's even more insidious than that. For instance, if you're an African nation, you do not have the resources to go out and catch fish, say, say 40, 50 miles offshore. Then under international agreements, you have to allow uh, other countries to come in and take those fish. You have, they pay a licensing fee, but you cannot refuse. And so that leads to, you know- Because you're not harvesting it. You're not taking advantage yeah, of it. It's almost like you're not allowed to leave it alone. And- It and drives your own people into poverty, right? I mean, what can they eat from and what can they do? Now, when, for instance, when people say that we're attacking the fishing industry and that, that there's a billion people who depend upon fish for their survival, they're, they're actually twisting the truth. Yes, there are a billion people who survive on fishing, but they're not the people running the industrialized trawlers and the gigantic long lines. And, and well, not only are those people taking the fish from the sea at an incredible uh, rate, but they're also driving more and more people into impoverishment all the time. 
one of the problems that we found in Africa is African fishermen going out in their small boats, they get run down by these industrial mm -hmm. fishing boats. They just leave them in their wake. They kill people. And yet nobody pays too much attention to it. There is, I mean, we were in the film, uh, Sea Spiracy, and there was, of course, a lot of stir up of that. Uh, people were like, oh, my God, how can you go so far and demanding that you um, shouldn't eat fish? And I got a lot of discussions and conversations with the, especially the governments that are partners of Palais, where they said, hey, we are in some parts depending on fish, right? Yes, but nobody's I, arguing with that. If somebody from Liberia is going out and in, in their canoe, there's no problem with that. No problem with that. What we no. have a problem is with hundred million dollar drag uh, drag trawlers and and hundred mile long long lines and drip nets. The, the industrialized mechanized mechanized fishing industry, the heavy gear industry, is literally destroying life in the ocean. But there's also exactly it's like the totally industrialization of catching fish where. These animals don't have a hiding ground and they don't have time to um, procreate, right? There is no, no. There is no safe ha haven anymore. And, if but you, also, look, at, if you yeah. look at the size of a, of a codfish from 1900 until now, it's, you know, uh, what could be well over two, two and a half meters, now 18 inches. You know, it's just like uh, you don't see the big fish anymore. They've been wiped. They've been wiped out. And uh, but then also, I mean, we're speaking often about um, Asia, South Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia, we're speaking about Chinese uh, fishing fleets, we're speaking about North Korean fleets. But the truth is, when you're looking into Europe, right, the Mediterranean, it's a, quite a dead sea now. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and there are like massive undertakings of like European retail chains that are putting also thousands of vessels out there, vacuum cleaning, using electrified um, nets and all. I mean, there's not big, really a big difference, right? You can't say, no. oh my God, it's all happening in Asia. No, one of the worst, uh, uh, most destructive fishing fleets uh, is the Spanish fishing fleet. Uh, they're, ta they're, they're involved with more illegal activities than any other fleet that I know of. Shark uh, fishing, especially tuna and so on, right? Yeah, they were the ones that uh, we intercepted with the chasing of the thunder. That was, a, you know, we call it the Galician Mafia from Spain. They're, they're sending these ships all over the place. And when you take them to court in Spain, the judges just say, oh, it's out of our jurisdiction. We can't do anything about it. Uh, so th it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real problem. Uh, the problem is, is that it, I call it the tragedy of the commons, which is everybody knows that these species are disappearing and being diminished, but their attitude is that if we don't catch the fish, well, somebody else is going to catch the fish, so we might as well catch the fish. That's That seems to be the way that they look at it. And uh, they just accept the fact that it's going to disappear. You have in your application forms, you have that statement in there, are you ready are you willing to give your life or are you willing to die for a whale? Uh, how committed does a volunteer have to be to become part of a movement to make a contribution? I think that's a, a reasonable request. Are you willing to risk your life, not just to protect a whale, but to protect species of fish or sea turtles or seabirds? And that, I think it's a reasonable request uh, because we don't ask, uh, we don't question when we ask young people to risk their life, to give their life, to take life. You know, protect your family, protect the country, protect or, other wars humans. Over, more than that, wars over real estate, over oil wells, over religion. And that I think is a far more noble pursuit to risk. Uh, it's about protecting life. It's about like saying, hey, this is life. I don't make a difference. Um, yeah, do you think that's the big problem that people see in animals often an object, a product or something, a property even, that there is ownership rather than empathy and acknowledgement that there is some being on life uh, eye level? It's what our values are. You know, a few years ago, a, a ranger in Zimbabwe shot and killed a poacher who was about to kill a black rhinoceros. And human rights groups uh, attacked him viciously. How dare you take a human animal? I think his answer really explained it quite well. He said, you know, if I was a policeman in Harare and a man ran out of Barclays Bank with a bag of money and I shot him dead on the street, they'd pin a medal on me and call me a hero. So how is it that a bag of paper is worth more than the future heritage of Zimbabwe? It's what we value. We don't value life. We value property. And uh, so when you risk your life to protect life, that's considered a little unusual. But when you risk your life to protect property or profits or oil wells, well, that's considered... Totally understandable for people. Hey, there's a question coming in from Evelyn Chavon. Um, how do we move from being a society of concerned people that are really concerned about the environment um, to actually fight, fighting for it, taking it in their own hands. What can people actually do then more than liking, more than discussing, more than debating? What is in the, what's the power of everyone that they can actually 
um, uh, use here? Well, find out what your passion is uh, and harness it to the virtues of courage and imagination and go with it and don't be deterred by criticism. I mean, look what uh, Greta Thunberg's been able to accomplish. Just a 16 year old schoolgirl has been able to reach millions of people because she's committed. She's persistent and she's got a lot of imagination. She's passionate and she's courageous. Each and every one of us has the power to to change the world, to make that uh, to make that kind of difference. But I also think that we have to uh, e evolved from this anthropocentric point of view that we have, that it's all about us. Everything is about humans. We have to understand that if we're going to survive, we have to live with all those other species. We have to take a biocentric- we Collaborate life. with nature. We really yeah, have, that, we have part to perfect nature. We're not dominant, that we're part of everything. You know, a few years ago, I had a reporter from the Fox Network called me up and he said, you know, did you say that worms, trees, bees, and, uh, uh, and fish were more important than people? And I said, yeah, I did say that. And he said, how could you say something so outrageous? And I said, well, it's very simple. Uh, those species, we need those species. They don't need us, but we need them. We can't live without them. They are ecologically more important than we are. And if we think that we can survive on this planet without that interdependence with those species, then we're, we're going to not survive at all. We just simply can't do it. We have to learn to live in harmony with them. I read a lot of sci-fi in the last days, to be honest. Um... I had a lot of like serious nonfiction books and then I went right away for sci-fi and um, all of them pretty much are doomsday, right? We live in, in, in on other planets. We, are, we even have to buy, we don't have to only buy the water and the food. We also have to buy the air. Um, it's like, it's, it's getting complex, right? I mean, we humans are like so adaptable to stupid situations. And in this last book I read, the people that grew up on Mars or even on a lunar base, they didn't know anymore how it is to be in a free world where you can just breathe or we can just walk around and you don't have to worry about the atmosphere and, and so on. I think that often people simply don't know the difference and they get very quickly used to a new, new status quo. And yeah. I mean, I would like to compare that with the time. I mean, I already, in the last 10 years since I'm doing Palais, nine years, I saw big differences, right? When I go in the water, when I go out there, even when I drive um, on a countryside, I see that there are no insects anymore on my windshield. I, I notice it all the time. The noises change, the, the life just disappears. But how must that be for you? I mean, 50 years ago, 1971, I mean, how did the oceans, how did nature look back then when you compare it to, to now? Do you still know that difference or you also just got used to a new situation? No, I've seen the difference, and what we what we've seen is a steady adaptation to diminishment. That we just simply accept that diminishment. The fishing village that I was raised in uh, in the 1950s uh, is no longer what it was. You know, the one thing that people didn't eat were mussels; they were considered dirty. Well, that, that's what you get when you go in the restaurant now. Turbot, which was considered a garbage fish, that's what you get in a restaurant in Paris and New York now. Uh, but nobody ate ate it back then. It's constant adaptation to to diminishment. And uh, so, yeah, the world has changed. But the problem is, is that very few people have noticed because generation, well, that's the way it is. So we forget the way it was. And then we just move on. I think it's very important that we have a, an understanding of our own history, because if we understand history, you know where you are. And if you know who where you are, then you know where you're going. And that means that a child born 500 years from now is part of your reality. It's as the Mohawks say, uh, make no decision in your life until you take into account the consequences of that decision on all future generations. Because as a conservationist or an environmentalist, what you do today impacts what the world would be like 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, even a million years from now. It's forming a mindset, right? It's forming values. It's standing up for, for a future. It's actually creating future. We shape the future. When people say to me, well, don't you ever get depressed or pessimistic? I said, no, because I don't focus on that. I focus on the today, doing what you're doing today. Uh, put all your energies into those actions today, and that will determine what the future will be. And uh, don't, don't be deterred by the possibilities. Focus on the, uh, the realities. And I think that um, fits very well to the question from Vicky. Um, she's more, more or less asking for what is uh, the metrics of a successful positive uh, a growth of a, of a movement. And I would answer that you can't really put a metrics to anything. Sometimes it's just one person that you inspire to do something or encourage to do something that can change the world. Sometimes it's yourself. You, you, I think there's, it's very difficult to, and it's a quite an, a social media phenomenon that we are always looking at 
uh, defining success by likes, by followers, and and all this stuff. It, you can have a 10 million followers and it doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah. If you don't stand for it, if you don't have the credibility, if people are just observing you because you're obscure. I think at some points, it's not about that anymore. It's not about audience. It's about what do you I stand for? What do I send out for a message? And you never know what you change. You will probably never find out what you um, impacted. And it so should not your that should not be the, the pay for your work, right? Yeah, the world has been changed by people who uh, died and didn't even know that they were responsible for that change. You know, the history is full of, uh, of those kind of things, you know, decisions made. Uh, but it's you have to be persistent. It's cumulative. You know, slavery, for instance, in America, it wasn't ended overnight by Abraham Lincoln. It was because of the efforts. It's not by one person either. I mean, sometimes people die, 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 die. I mean, a big yeah. revolution. People that give lives. And sometimes it's thousands of people that gave their lives. Yeah, Wilberforce, former and resistance. And John Brown and the abolitionists mm -hmm. and all this. The same with women getting the vote in America. Uh, you know, hundreds and thousands, actually, thousands of women who had to struggle and sacrifice to get that. What I find absurd is that Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States, gets credit for the amendment, giving women the rights, he was the one who challenged them and was against them every step of the way. And when they won what they were fighting for, he gets the credit. And that really sums it up. Politicians take credit for the initiative, the courage, and the imagination of individuals. CEOs too. <laughs> um, and they're dealing with so many companies, shareholders, governments, and it's a mess, right? It's very rare that the person who actually leads an organization, it's very rare, and I'm very excited when they are, that they actually know what they're doing and they're actually standing up for it. Often they're just playing safe because they don't want to take any risk and always be able to blame somebody else if it, it fails and jump on it if it wins. Right. I think that this, there are just people that are representing and there are people that want to actually change things. And that's fine. I know. What can I do? But I want to answer to Mike Gass question, or actually it was not. It was more a statement that there is no time to be pessimistic or depressed. I have to admit that I have moments of total exhaustion, you know, where I'm really exhausted. And these moments, I feel depressed. I feel pessimistic. But I also know in these moments, I shouldn't give an interview. I shouldn't have a conversation. I should just sleep, eat and sleep and watch some stupid movie because the energy comes back. But it is only depressing, um, and I think that's what the, the principle here is, if you're looking for today's achievement, if you're looking for confirmation that you're doing the right thing, if you lead that away and you just focus on the path ahead of you and the people that you're definitely convinced, even if it's just a few, and you just go forward, then you don't even uh, step into that trap. But that means also you have to master your insecurity because often, you're looking to the outside to be reassured that you're on the right path while you actually should just look inside. And to be honest, there are so many examples of people surviving decades in prison and they didn't have anybody um, giving them assurance. No. Well, I mean, the, the most valuable lesson I ever learned in 1973 when I was uh, I volunteered as a medic for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. And uh, we didn't have any hope of winning. We were surrounded. They were shooting at us. They wounded 46. They killed two, uh, you know, the government forces. And, and I went to Russell Means, who is the leader of the American Indian Movement. And I said, look, we have no hope of winning. We can't. We're outnumbered. We're overwhelmed. What are we doing here? And then he told me something that stayed with me all my life. He says, well, we're not, we're not concerned about winning or losing. We're not concerned about the odds against us. We're here because it's the right place to be, the right time to do it, and the right thing to do. Don't worry about the future. Concentrate on the on the present. What you do today will determine what the future will be. And so his actions back then are still having uh, rever uh, reverberations into what the future for Indigenous people is. And so, you know, the, these uh, actions live long after people die. So when you and I'm looking at the comments here, um, what do we do? And that is Elise Bernal. Bernal. Um, what do we think about people who are protecting the oceans or standing up or getting vocal around protecting the oceans, but then you see them eating seafood and often even in public events. I mean, we saw it at conferences or expeditions of environmentalists in, in the most obscure situations we saw people yeah, eating seafood what do you think about that 
Well, it's a disassociation. I remember I was with Sylvia Earle at a conference that was put together by Conservation International, and uh, they're all there. And the subject was uh, overfishing. And we went in for the uh, banquet, and it was nothing but a smorgasbord of every seafood product you could think of. You know, they just didn't connect. They just didn't connect it. But I think that's changing. More and more people are becoming aware of those contradictions. And, uh, you know, people get threatened when you say, well, you shouldn't eat uh, seafood or you, you shouldn't eat meat and everything like that. But they really have to think about it. I mean, the single greatest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions is the meat industry. The single greatest contributor to groundwater pollution, meat industry, single greatest contributor to dead zones in the ocean. And the media, 40 percent of all the fish caught in the ocean is fed to uh, to pigs and to chickens and to uh, farm raised salmon. It's a vicious industry. And uh, and it's also an industry responsible for the emergence of tsunami transmission of viruses. So we have to, if we don't get control of that, it's going to become more and more of a problem. Tim Falls asks, how do you deal with people close to you, right? Family, friends, loved ones that hear your message, probably even see how you're fighting for the good, but they're not even considering changing. They, they, they say no to what you suggest, no to what you stand for. Well, fortunately, I don't have any question is, should you actively try to pursue them um, or what or just let them be? What is the approach here? Well, fortunately, I don't have anybody in my family that is opposed to what <laughs> I'm doing. But uh, I, I would say that you have to go with your own conscience. And, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, you don't want to anger your parents, say, or whatever like that. But, uh, you know, just be tolerant and uh, be persistent or cons and consistent with your uh, with your with your message and people will come around at some point because they're going to have to or else we're just not going to survive. I mean, in my in my situation, to be honest, I'm like. I'm poking, I provoke, but I do it in a very humorful, humorous way. I don't never really try to be. I mean, sometimes I'm frustrated, but um, I'm never angry. I'm never attacking anybody. And I think what I learned at Palais is do your thing. You just do your thing. and. Uh, People observe you, and if they like it, then they're gonna they're gonna mimic it or take something off it, or at least they start thinking about it. Um, but the moment you try to preach or you try to transform actively, and you are you're becoming too obvious, I feel, and too manipulative, I think it's it misfires. But it helps to kind of be very very clear in why you're doing it, and it's not an ideological thing, right? This is about It actually makes sense. I think approaching it more from a logical standpoint and also a little bit from a coolness standpoint, like, hey, this is just something you can't do anymore. You know, like, what? You're still eating fish? I mean, there is a good way, I think, in, in approaching this. And it can, be, it can be fun. You can make a lot of jokes around that, even end of, end of the world jokes, apocalyptic jokes, right? Oh, this could be the last fish you're eating. I was invited in, um, at an opening of a museum in Marseille, pretty much at the beginning of Palais. Um, I think it was 2014, and they asked me to say something. And the buffet was full with little plastic cups, mm -hmm. full, filled up with seafood or sea life, dead sea life. And I'm like, oh my God, okay, here's a cup. And I built that into my speech in a very funny way. I said, hey, enjoy it. It could be the last time you're eating, you're eating sea life, right? And also the cup, and probably you... You're going to see that for the next thousand years, though. And that was it. And there was one politician in there who heard that, and he built his whole election campaign around plastic afterwards and protecting animals out there. And it was just, honestly, it was just a little funny remark. I didn't want to embarrass the organizers because they, they invited me in. But on the other hand, I couldn't just ignore it. You know, you had to say something. But I think just find your own tone there. Find your own way of, like, poking people. Right. So I think there is another question. Let me see. How much do the pair of you bump into surfers against sewage? Oh yeah, um, we love we love as we love them. Um, it's a collaborator. We support them. We 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 are friends. Um, I think they're doing a fantastic job. They're very good in communicating as well, because I think that as one part of what you do out there. Um, there is yes, go and clean up beaches as much as you can. But the other side is communication. And Paul, you are a communication expert. I mean, you're, you learned communication, right? Um, how important do you think is true action versus or plus communication, the media part of it? 
Well, I think it's important to have collaborations. One of the things we do with Sea Shepherd is that we look on surfers and uh, divers and free divers and, and uh, sailors as ambassadors for the ocean and try to work with them as, as much as we can. But we also work with artists and with uh, performers and that because they're, you know, in, in the media culture that we live in, that's where you uh, get changes. For a good example of, uh, you know, how do you, you get a message across to people who it's very difficult to get a message across. For instance, they had captured all these dolphins and uh, orcas and belugas in, uh, in Russia, and we wanted to get the Russian government to release them. And I wrote a speech, but nobody in Russia is going to listen to what I'm talking about. So we just simply sent Pamela Anderson over to give the speech because uh, uh, we knew that Putin was a big a, a fan of Pamela Anderson. So she went over to Russia, gave the speech, and they released the dolphins. Uh, you know, So it just shows you what uh, you know people can do. Um, you, you, you go with what works. And in our media culture, celebrities have a lot of power. And if you can get them to uh, to speak up on on these things, you, it's amazing what you can accomplish. If they're credible. And with Pamela, you have, fortunately, a very credible warrior, really, that lives everything she talks. And there are a lot of celebrities out there that just do a thing for a moment. And next next moment, you see them with the fur. OK, they understood that by now. Um, but then you see him with other things and um, you just see that they don't really understand what they were standing up for. They just learn from their agent. It's a good thing to do. Yeah. But I think you have been very good in, in picking celebrities that or they picked you. You attracted them um, that are totally honest and true. Well, we also have to understand the power of the media. I've always said that the camera is the most powerful weapon that's ever been invented. And, uh, you know, the recent success of Seaspiracy was not only was it a good uh, documentary film, but it was successful because of the medium. It was on Netflix, just as Blackfish got on CNN about 30 times. Uh, so what's, there's no point in making the greatest documentary in the world if nobody's going to see it. So you have to work to get it into the proper medium that's going get, to get out and reach millions of people. And it was very authentic. It came in the right moment where people like were so fed up of lies. Mm -hmm. And they, there was this guy just like talking what he thinks. And putting it out there, personal perspective. This is me. I'm trying to be a good citizen. I'm trying everything. I'm not finding the right advice. And, and it's a story. And people like stories like Rob Stewart's Shark Water or Diane Fossey with Gorillas in the Mist. Uh, you know, people like to have narratives. Stories. Yeah. And, they, you know, they don't want to be bombarded with facts and figures and statistics and everything. Uh, and so if you can get your story to include all of those things you want people to pay attention to, then that's, uh, I think, the secret of a successful documentary film. I think what changed, um, what I observed, I mean, I, I'm witnessing it firsthand, in the last three years, um, probably in the last, of course, it's totally increased in the last 12, 16 months, that suddenly it's okay to be radical. Suddenly it's okay to ask for radical steps. And in 2018 still, when I <laughs> brought you with me to the United Nations, they all freaked out. And they were like, oh, my God, how can you do that? There is, he's so controversial. And, and they were like dissing me. Why would I um, <clears throat> work with such a controversial person? Um, and today I feel it's totally fine. Aren't you like bored that you're not anymore the Enfant Terrible? Yeah, I mean, they're actually teaching courses on what Sea Shepherd does in the uh, U.S. Navy uh, war college. You know, uh, so you're an establishment suddenly, man. You have, yeah, you have to. So yeah, we're no longer we're we're no longer radical. We've become mainstream. So I guess we've got to step up our, our our game in a way. But also one of the things that Sea Shepherd has been from the very beginning is I implemented a strategy called aggressive nonviolence, and I think that's the key to our success. We're aggressive, but we don't hurt anybody. And in 42 years of operations, we've not injured or killed anybody, but we shut down hundreds and hundreds of uh, illegal operations. And so. Um, so that's the thing. I think be as aggressive as possible to make sure you don't kill anybody. <laughs> um, Amelia says, Amelia Lima, Lim, sorry, says it's way more fun to be radical and pick all battles. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Um, it's also, to be honest, at some points you want to end somewhere. You want to bring it somewhere. And at Palais, we, we are totally going for collaboration, right? I mean, we are br brutal, but often and most of the times behind closed doors. We don't believe in embarrassing people, you know? Um, it's more like going, getting under their skin and getting into their family, getting their kids to change their parents, right? And making sure yeah. that they can't escape it. Because if you attack, obviously from outside, often people can hide. They can just say, oh my God, this is so loud. This is so ugly. I can just, oh, this is not okay. Well, it's a little different with us because we're dealing with criminals. So I don't have any problem with embarrassing them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. 
So last question, Paul. What can we all learn from pirates? Why is the pirate life the better life or the well, other back, way around? Back in the what 90s when our, when our critics were calling us pirates, I said, oh, OK, well, if you're going to call us pirates, we'll be pirates. And we got our own pirate flag and everything like that. But if you go look at history, pirates were way ahead of their time in, uh, say, the, the 17th century. Uh, the, um, you know, those ships were the pirate ships were run as democracies. They had racial equality. They had gender equality. They voted who the captain would be. But most importantly, they got things done because they cut through the bureaucracy. And I found it really interesting, if you look at the history of piracy, that uh, England, France, and Spain used pirates to get things done. <laughs> and so they were putting them on the front lines. Uh, you know, piracy in the Caribbean was shut down by Henry Morgan, who actually really became a pirate when they rewarded him by making him governor of Jamaica. That's when he became a real pirate. But uh, <laughs> that's, I think, the secret of it, that they get things done. Right, Paul. It was a pleasure, like always. Um, sending you all the love and thank you everybody in the audience for taking the time on a Wednesday afternoon or wherever on the planet you are and see you soon again. Thank you. Thank and you. hey, keep up the fight. Whatever, whatever skill you have, whatever superpower is in you, um, there is no color, there is no size, all that doesn't matter. Just do whatever you can to contribute to the cause. And if it just is that you're open to new things and and but also be skeptical about them and, and just develop your own opinion you know and and try to not um follow with the things that we call standards you know that we just like cut in don't be afraid to amaze yourself at what you can actually accomplish if you uh if you harness your passion to imagination and courage you can change the world it's all in here yeah <laughs>